Fireside Chat, Episode 16, the sixth overall pick, recorded May 8th, 2013. Are you ready? See you, Brad. It's time for another episode of Fireside Chat, featuring Dan, Matt, and Lucas. And we're back for the 16th episode of Fireside Chat, and this episode is a special episode. This is our draft preview, and this is going to be over a couple different parts. This episode, we're going to be talking about the overall draft strategy for the Flames and their first pick, which is sixth overall. And of course, I'm not doing it alone. I'm joined by Matt and Lucas. How are you guys doing? Very good. I'm great. Every time I hear nondescript metal chords, I know it's time to talk vague approximations about what I think is going to happen in the world of hockey. That's why we pay you the few bucks we do. Still waiting on that check. I know. It got lost in the mail. Stamps.com, man. Uh, never, They never lose your shit. You want me to put U.S. postage on it? Why not? Sure, why not? It's postage. Well, guys, getting into our draft special. Um, we know the Flames have three picks in the first 30, which I haven't gone back to check, but I think that's the most the Flames have ever had in the first round. We've actually ne- we've never we've never had more than one. Never had more than one. Yeah. And the only pick we know for sure where we're picking right now is sixth overall, and that was our draft lottery position. Yeah, so that's what we're going to focus uh, this episode on, ladies and gentlemen. If you want to know what's going to happen with picks uh, 25 and 29 tentatively, but go Islanders just because, um, uh, next next week, be patient. Don't don't We, we don't give it up all at once. That's we're right. We're on cheap dates. We're going to roll this out over a couple episodes. So this episode will focus on the sixth overall pick and the general draft strategy we think the Flames should use. Different experts have different opinions on this, but I think we've all been going by uh, Bob McKenzie's list as the basis of this. And based on them and most others, the sixth selection is expected to be uh, Lindholm. Yeah, it's it's uh, to me it's a toss up. I think at this point, uh, I think you look at different mock drafts on the internet. It's going to be either uh, uh, Sean Monahan or Elias Lindholm two of the best centers available, or the two best centers available, barring anyone in the top five uh, going off the board and one of those players falling to us. Before we chat about those guys, let me just run through some stats here. So Elias Lindholm is a Swedish player. He's a natural center, something this team doesn't have a lot of. He's 5'11", and his weight's 181 pounds, born in uh, 94. And this year he played... Um, 48 games and got 30 points, which is pretty good, plus one. Sean Monaghan, uh, he's been playing in the OHL. He's also a centerman, born in 94. He's 6'2 and 186 pounds. So skinnier kid. I mean, he's only five pounds heavier than Lindholm, but he's 6'2 instead of 5'11. So they'll probably want, if they draft him, for him to put on some muscle. I'm sure he will. Matt, where do you think that six pick's going to go to? I... I'm not really sure. I think we're going to draft a center, but I'm not sure really which one. Because each one of them has a completely different skill set, and we need both. So, you know, it's really a toss-up to me. So if you're sitting at the draft table and it's your call as soon as Bettman says Calgary's on the board, you'd have a hard time picking? You think you'd just pick when you get up there? I would be tossing it around my head. I would probably lend, lean more towards Elias Lindholm just because in the little bit I've seen of him, he seems to have that little bit more of skill and talent. Even though he is a little shorter, you know, he does seem to have a little bit more there. But, you know, it's... You, you're picking between two guys that are both lo- looking like they'll be 50-plus point centers in the NHL. So, you know, 
you can't really complain if you can't go we, wrong either way. No, especially because we need both. We do. Uh, if if I'm looking at uh, if if I'm looking at uh, a toss up between Monaghan and Lindholm, it almost looks like sort of a a mirror image of Nathan McKinnon, Jonathan Drouin. Uh, simply because Monaghan is less flashy, but is drawing comparables to Jonathan Taves. And the stuff that he I've seen of him on my very limited exposure to him is, you know, a guy who's very cerebral, uh, very uh, good in all aspects of the game. Uh, I read one report that said Monaghan uh, was as close to as automatic in the face-off dot as one scout had ever seen in the OHL which, given our propensity to lose face-offs, uh, seems to be something that the organization should value pretty highly. On the other hand, Jonathan, or not Jonathan Drew, Lindholm is bloody dynamic. He is just, he's fast, he's creative, he uh, distributes the puck extremely well, he's a very good skater, uh, but I've heard, also, I've also read reports that he projects more as a winger in the NHL, and I'm not quite sure what the reasons are for that, but that to me seems like a Drouin who's more flashy, but apparently is a center as well, uh, versus McKinnon who's more of a dependable two-way center, and going, you know, saying nothing remotely uh, uh, off the off the board with this, you can't go wrong with either of them. Uh, I would almost be, I, I, I said a couple weeks ago uh, Lindholm would be my guy simply because he's more dynamic, but I really wonder uh, taking the best center available if that's not uh, if that's not Monaghan. Well, the thing is that Lindholm was also extremely good in the faceoff circle in Sweden. I think he won like fifty-seven or fifty-eight percent of the draws over there. So, yeah, it, he might not be as good in the dot as Monaghan, but he's not uh, bad by any stretch of the imagination. Mm-hmm. I, so. And Lindholm was playing in the Swedish men's league, right? Yes, yeah. he was, and that makes that's what makes him, you know, all the more impressive. I mean, I don't, again, I don't know that uh, I, I wouldn't be upset with Lindholm by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, although, admittedly, when someone throws around Jonathan Taves as a comparable, you do sort of maybe that clouds things a bit because uh, I mean, Monahan was on an awful, awful sixty sevens team this year. One thing to consider, though, is that Carolina picks fifth overall, and they've had a propensity to draft players out of the OHL with their first picks the last half dozen years, and the best OHL player is Monaghan, so we might not, you know, have a choice. It might just be Lindholm, so... It, which I think everyone would be fine with. Yeah, 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 for sure. Uh, I I think Carolina and uh, uh, several t- several mocks have uh, Carolina going with Valerie Nichushkin, and I, I think the reason they've done that is pretty obvious. They just signed Semin for another five years with thirty five million. You should probably get some other Russian in there, and the fact that you've got Alexander Semin there makes it all the more likely that a Russian is more willing to come over and play for your team so maybe they're less afraid of the russian factor and nichushkin frankly has all the tools to be maybe the best player in the draft if he was if he was finnish he would be in the conversation with mckinnon and jones let me pose a slightly different scenario to you guys i iss the international scouting service has their draft ranking up and they have um they have for sixth barkov and Lindholm not till eighth place with Monahan at nine. If we go up to the stage to make our pick at sixth and Barkov is still available, do you take him over any of the two guys we've already talked about, Lindholm or McKinnon? Definitely. Or sorry, Monahan? Definitely without even a second thought. Yes, you don't even let Gary Bettman finish saying the Calgary Flames are on the clock. You shove him out of the way and you take Alexander Barkov. Without yeah. question. He's basically Oli he's basically Oli Jokinen without the head problems. You know, in terms of skill. He can be a, a dominating first line center. So yeah. I've seen some of uh, Barkov play in the World Juniors and I really liked what I saw there. 
Um, I saw a little bit of Lindholm too, but yeah, if, I mean, if we can get Barkov at six, as the ISS is predicting, which I don't think we will, but if somehow he falls that far, I think you have to take him. Yeah, I don't think he gets past Nashville, and for everyone who's, who hears the name Ole Jokinen and freaks out, uh, keep in mind, Ole Jokinen was pretty damn good until he nearly guillotined his own teammate. That, that'll, you know, that'll mess with you. Uh, I was just going to say, like, Jokinen was a 80-90 point guy for, like, four years in a row before the skate incident. So, you know, like, if we, if Barkov turns into that, like, you know, even has the chance to turn into that, you have to take him. Yeah, just make everyone wear neck guards. Yeah. Yeah, you could do that. I mean, yeah, if he can do even, you know, a, three quarters of what Jokinen was producing for points early on in his career... We'd be good. I'm just looking at who the IAS moved into the top five in order to push Barkov down. And uh, according to their rankings, and they may not be looking at it by team need, but according to their rankings, um, Darnell Nurse will go fifth. So I can't see Carolina taking a defenseman, but who knows. No, although you know what? If anyone in the in this top five was going to reach on a defenseman i mean i i would think if they fell in love with them either tampa or carolina could do it carolina's defense is awful tampa's defense is awful and like if you've got saint louis le cavalier stamkos and the entire you know the entire offense of the lightning is not the lightning's problem i could see them maybe going with uh with the defenseman if they really fell in love with him. But I don't think they'll do it for a guy who's as proje- who projects to be as raw right now as Darnell Nurse. Though, having watched him recently, he looks like he's going to be filthy when he in about two years. So if you're, you're saying if someone's going to reach, you think it would be Carolina, which could potentially push Barkov down for us? Well, I mean, Tampa could... Uh, and if Tampa reaches, then yeah, I mean, then of course, uh, if Tampa reaches, then presumably Nashville takes either McKinnon or Drouin, and then we've got, you know, th- then there's a, you know, who knows. It still does the dominoes effect yeah. and push them back by one. Yeah. By the way, we're all in agreement. Do you guys think there's anyone else... Um... Yeah, I, I think we're in agreement. It's probably going to be Lindholm or Monahan. I think it'll be Lindholm. If it was up to, like, if I, I was betting, I would bet on Lindholm. But that's the thing with the draft. Like, you just never know. Because sometimes teams, like, if you look at the Jets when they took Shifle, you know, like, he was expected to go in, like, the 15 to 20 mark, and yet he went 7th overall. So you don't really know if someone's going to fall in line, love with, say, like Ryan Pulak or something, you know, ahead of us. Mm-hmm. You don't know. Let's say that the Flames do take either Lindholm or Monaghan. Um, what do you guys think the chance is that either one of those guys makes the NHL roster next year? I would hope that they don't. I think Lindholm has a chance to make the NHL roster. I think Monaghan for sure goes back to junior. I'm with Matt. I would hope that neither one would. My my thinking with Lindholm is Lindholm put up pretty good numbers in a men's league in Sweden, or in in the Swedish Elite League. Monaghan put up very good numbers on an awful OHL team, but he was still playing against kids. So he probably needs more time to just... Uh, fill out, finish, developing a little bit. Uh, Lindholm, I think, can probably make the jump. His, all his physical stuff is there. He thinks the game very well. So I, I would be interested to see them. I, I think he at least gets you know the 10-game the tryout. I think both do, but you know I don't see them sticking for like the whole season because that wouldn't be really good for their development. Let me pose another scenario. What do you what do you think um, the chance would be that the Flames trade up to get both those guys? Oh, you mean to get Lindholm and Monaghan? 
Lindholm and Monahan, or or either a combination of somebody else, but essentially trade up from let's assume 25th or 29th to perhaps take both those guys, or take Nurse or somebody else, but to get a a better selection in the top 10, two selections in the top 10. Oh, if they could say package up, uh, say Giordano or something like that, like because I know the Oilers and the Sabers both need a good defenseman, that. It's possible. It not probable, but it's possible. I wouldn't be opposed to it. You know, but it's one of those where it really depends on what the asking price is. Yeah, I I would expect uh, moving up into a second top ten pick with nothing but the twenty fifth and twenty ninth tentatively. Uh, is going to be pretty difficult, nigh impossible, and I don't think it's really worth trading a roster player like Giordano to do that. But I would say the odds of them moving up in the into the top five or to, even top three, uh, that's far more, I guess, likely and manageable, especially with the amount of picks and assets we've got to work with. But I don't realistically see either happening i think they do if if they don't stand pat with all three first round picks one of the first probably gets traded down and we'll discuss that in our next show as well talking about the other two picks um here's another scenario then let's say that the flames are on the clock it's the sixth overall pick and both lindholm and monahan are available um, what do you think the probability would be that the flames perhaps trade down from sixth to seventh or six to eighth pick up a, a second or third round pick and still get their man. One of those two, if we're assuming those are their men. Well, if, say, Buffalo really wants to move up and, you know, they're going to take one of the defensemen like Ristolainen or Nurse, then why not? You're still going to get one of the two. But, yeah, I wouldn't trade out of the top I eight. I think Buffalo and Edmonton will probably both take defensemen. Yeah, like I wouldn't trade out of the top eight because nine, you're start, starting to get into, you know, not quite as good of players. Yeah, I mean, if, if Lindholm and Monaghan are on the board at sixth, I think Edmonton and Buffalo will probably both take defensemen. So you could theoretically, yeah, trade, trade down to eighth, still get one of those two. When you get to ninth, I think you could probably still get one of those two, but there's no sure bet. And if we lose those two, yeah, you're not really getting the player you need. Yeah, I I think this is not the... uh, The sixth overall pick is not the time to be clever, Uh, especially at this stage of the organization's uh, history. Uh, Take the best player available your second round pick or whatever, find another way to recoup a second round pick. You don't get extra depth that way by sacrificing the best pick you've had since in a decade. Yeah, I'm just looking here, and if they did trade out of the top nine or and into the ninth spot or lower, and we assume those guys are both gone, Hunter Shinkarik is the next highest-ranked centerman from Medicine Hat of the WHL, and... Yeah, I mean, his stats don't look like a top 10 guy. No. Like, that's where you're starting to get into so-so types. Like, you could go... Like, if you wanted a defenseman at that pick, then, like, you could go a Zadaroff or Pulak or something. But, yeah, I think centers are more important right with the first pick anyway. Well, especially with where the Flames are at and the fact they played... You know, a whole season, uh, we should say a whole half season, a condensed season, but they played the year without a full roster of natural centermen. I think everyone knows this team needs to find centermen quickly. Yeah. And the only way you get them is by drafting. At least, really. Good ones. Name name me the franchise centers who get constantly uh, traded. Or, or, Or who have been traded. Joe Thornton. In recent memory. Yeah, that's it. and Jokinen and maybe Brad Richards. Like, not a lot. Yeah, okay, French, so franchise centers get traded when 
Florida is being mismanaged, and Tampa's ownership is either running out of money, doesn't have any money, or is a complete clown show. That That's when franchise centers get traded. Although you could argue if Brad Richards is a franchise center anymore. Yeah, same with Jokin. <laughs> but... Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't happen. So yeah, you know, if you you have the chance to get a sixty point guy, you know, you take that, you know, without even thinking. Yeah, I think you're right. Looking past this first round, because we'll talk about the other picks next week. But looking past the first round, what do you guys think the Flames have to employ for a draft strategy? You've got seven rounds of picks to make. What should they be looking for? Well, for me, I would, if you have two players that are equivalent in terms of how you think they'll turn out, take the player that's bigger, but don't emphasize height only. Like, if you have a guy that's 5'11", but he's dynamic, and the rest of them are guys that profile to be versions of Wayne Primo, then take the skill guy, but... Yeah, you know, like they need size, but not to skimp on skill. Yeah, they they, they need I think to uh, focus after the top pick, especially uh, on some guys that play with a bit of edge to them, whether it's uh, forward or defense. Uh, and I'm not saying specifically you go after a Brandon Press t- projected type player early. But at some point in the draft, you need to identify, or you need to have identified players who can fill that third line role, who will fight anybody type player, uh, because the, it's it's lacking in the organization, and uh, yeah, and some size on the back end would also be nice. Yeah, like if we can get more guys, like in the especially in like the fifth and beyond rounds, like Lance Boma where, you know, all-around pain-in-the-ass type player, then go for it. But especially with the top few picks, like, e- even into, like, the fourth round, don't bother to try and get more skill. Lucas, size on the back end sounds like something Sir makes a lot would look for at the draft table. Absolutely. Yeah, we like big, uh, we like big butts, Feaster. That's why you've still got a job. I think I think I agree with Matt and what Lucas was saying. Um, I would go for if there's two players of the same or very similar caliber, pick the bigger guy, not just in height, but in height weight combination. Pick the guy that's going to be the bigger boy. Um, I think that's one thing that's lacking since Sutter left is he always used to pick the big uh, Western Canadian boys, and they weren't always the best players, unfortunately. But he'd pick the best, the big Western Canadian boy, and I think we need a little bit more of that. Um, I think the Flames also need to be picking a little bit of each position. I think we need to make sure that this is a fairly even draft and we're getting some forwards, some defensemen, uh, maybe even toss in a goalie since a lot of our goalies are going to be leaving and our prospects moving into um, turning pro and moving into pro roles. I think we need to get a goaltending prospect in there. So I think it's got to be a fairly well-balanced draft as far as positions, but they need to be getting bigger guys. Yeah. I think that they should get another goalie at some point, even if it's tossing a seventh out of goalie. But, you know, you need to keep getting more goalies until one turns into a Jonathan Quick or a Henrik Lundqvist or, you know, a star goalie. So... And to me, I always think every time a goalie turns pro, a new goalie should be entering the system. Yeah. When we're drafting defensemen, uh, I, I think we need to uh, go a little bit bigger. If you look at our defensive prospects right now, the best ones, while they're not small, guys like Witherspoon, Saloff, and their ilk, they're, they're almost, uh, I would call them just mid-size. They're, you know, in that six foot, six foot one, 200 pound range, which is fine for the NHL, but there's outside of Breen, a real lack of bruising uh, uh, potential on the back end. So would you emphasize size over skill? Uh, In certain areas, yeah. I I think uh, 
the last couple drafts they've taken, or at least last draft they took uh, Culkin and uh, Kulak, and yeah, I know they took both. Yeah, Culkin and Kulak. Um, th- there's your skill defense prospect for right now. They've all, and again, keep in mind they've got uh, Sale off and John Ramage is coming into the system, but I think they do need a little bit more. They they need one or two more like just monster defensemen, ready to. Yeah, like if, turn if pro you could in the next get couple uh, six foot, if you could get a six foot four version of Patrick Sealoff, that would be ideal. Yeah. So if you're just going to be drafting monsters, if Jay Fish decides I want to get the biggest kids I can find, do you think you do that in the top three or four rounds, or do you think you save that for rounds five through seven and just then focus on getting big boys? I think you could do it in the second half of the first round. Or any time between the first or in the, the, between the second and fourth, it would require us actually having a second round pick. But I'm sure that's gonna happen some way or another. Uh, but yeah, I, I think it's it's something you address early on, or the earlier the better. Yeah, usually good defensemen are available only in the top two rounds, sometimes into the third, and then it, you know, it's very hit and miss like all players really but you know especially if you want if you're wanting like a guy that might eventually turn into a franchise guy you definitely need to spend a pick or two on a defenseman in the first couple of rounds yeah although sometimes you spend a pick on a defenseman in the third round and he gets nominated for the norris because he plays on a team with Sidney crosby very quickly on that subject um Ryan Suter, P.K. Subban, Chris Letang. Does anyone else get the feeling that one of those things is not like the other? Maybe I just don't like Chris Letang very much, but Chris Letang is... I don't know. He's a fine defenseman, but he seems very meh in every real... I don't know, in every defensive aspect. Like, there's nothing particularly... Why would you really want Chris Letang out in the last minute of the game? That's all I'm saying. Anyway, moving on. I've been flipping through the list today of prospects in all the rounds and just kind of seeing who's ranked where. And I don't claim to know many players past round two or three. I recognize some of their names, but couldn't tell you anything about them. And I'm thinking, you guys are right. If you're looking for a franchise defenseman, you have to go in rounds one, two, and maybe three. But if I'm a GM looking just for size to fill out those bottom either six forward roles or bottom two maybe three defensive roles I think once you hit round four there's a lot of big boys available I might start drafting more for size than looking for a franchise guy I mean just saying this guy's going to be big we can use him he can play that you know fifth sixth defensive role yeah and at that point if they if you turn a fifth or sixth round pick into a you know a five defenseman then you know that's a win even a seventh defenseman whose job it is to crush people, that would probably still be a win. True. When was uh, McGratton picked? Does anybody know what round he went? Was he even drafted? Undrafted free idea. agent, that would be my guess. He was drafted in the fourth round, 104 overall in 1999. So, you know, I mean, if we if McGratton, who's probably one of the most prolific tough guys this team's seen in a while, went fourth round, why not try your hand fourth, fifth round to get those big guys that perhaps can be converted to that role? Well, the thing is, though, is that there's still a lot of skill left on the boards in that those rounds, and I think we'd be better suited on... Like, until the skill evaporates, keep going for skill even though, like, we do need some size. Like, you know, like, I don't want to see us just pick plugs that you could easily just sign as No, I mean, agents. I wouldn't... You know what I mean? Like, you know, like I a wouldn't fighter... pick way off the board. No, well, that's the thing. Like, they're available, like, they're being picked where they should be. It's just, like, you know, like how we wasted a sixth-round pick on Riley Grant. But, well, why waste that when you can just go and sign a guy or get one off of waivers, you know what I mean? Like, it doesn't seem like a good use of assets. Because, like, if you can get a skilled guy, like, say, like, TJ Brody, 
who is a fourth rounder. Like if you what? can luck out. Yeah, and... I think if if there's a really skilled guy, you always have to take the skilled guy. But if there's a bunch of meh players, you know, if well, you're up there and the next five guys are all just meh players, take the big guy. Oh yeah, and that the thing is, is that this draft is actually fairly good right through about the 130, 140 mark in terms of actually having skilled players to that point. So, you know, like, you can probably get someone that has a lot of skill in the fifth round. So, I don't see, like, yeah, especially with four the, and a half rounds. Yeah, but there's always teams that go off the board for a dozen or so picks. So, you know, at, like, that's why I think that they should mainly focus on skill. And, like, if you're wanting to go the big burly guy try to get that in the sixth or seventh round like there's a guy uh carter rigby who you know he seems like a decent guy like that fits that mold but he'll likely go in the sixth or seventh round so you know like that okay. that's when i would go for that type but not before <laughs> you know because I think that we have too many needs as a team still for skill. <laughs> so, you know, at least for the next few drafts, we need, you know, as much skill as we can get in hopes that some of them actually hit the mark. <laughs> Even though, you know, like, I'm not saying, like, don't pick for size. I'm just, you know. Skill should be still number one on the list. You're saying favor skill over size. Yeah, and size being like number two. <laughs> skill first, size next, and you know if the skill's gone, then pick the biggest, meanest guys that you can find. Well, anything else overall you guys want to chat about about this draft? I want to chat about the Calgary Fire Department idling outside my window. Whoever you're saving is not worth it. I'm recording a podcast. You're screwing up my audio. <laughs> Perhaps you should write them a letter. Oh, no. I'm, I'm going to shout out my window and shake my fist. Get off my lawn. Like, they're, they're just sitting there. They're not doing anything. Turn off your engine. <laughs> we, we as taxpayers pay for that gas. Well, that and it's just, it's loud. Come on. I, like, there's no fire. You're not going anywhere. Turn off. Turn off the friggin' truck. Anyway. All right. What, well, let's wrap this up so that Lucas can go yell at the fireman. That's always good. Yeah. Any final words, guys? Well, I'm looking forward to the draft. Anyway, it'll definitely be a, the most entertaining Flames-related news in a long time. <laughs> oh, I agree. I agree. Are you guys going to be watching the draft this year? Always. Always. All right, let's wrap this show up for this week. Remind everybody that we do have our burning questions contest still going on. Uh, for more information, you can go to the Fireside Chat website, and you'll see the information about the contest. But jump onto Facebook or Twitter, answer one of our burning questions, and you'll be entered into a draw to win a Flames prize pack. And we'll see everybody back here next week for our analysis of the other two first-round picks the Flames have this year. Go Islanders, go Kings. <laughs> and go Capitals. And I'm glad Vancouver's out in four. Yeah. Suck it, Vancouver. We are the boys of chorus. We hope you like our show. We know you're looking for us, but now we have to go. Fireside Chat Podcast, produced and edited by Dan Stevenson.